Terry, to explore philosophy of biology in today's world, molecular biology is so important. And so we want to focus the lens of philosophy on molecular biology and uh, the genetic structure. Uh, you have this uh, wonderful uh, uh, thought that's very different than others uh, that, that we're talking to, how um, uh, molecules can become signs or molecules can be about something which is uh, one of the great challenges in philosophy of mind, among other places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, de develop that, uh, the logic behind your thinking. Well, first of all, what we know is that molecules are typically not about anything. Molecules are just molecules, yeah. and they interact. The question is, in biology, of course, we have some molecules that are about other molecules even, about how the way other molecules interact. Typically, those are uh, DNA or RNA, you know, these nucleotide polymers. Uh, the question that, that other people don't seem to ask that I ask is, how do they get that way? How did a molecule become about something else? Mm -hmm. Now, looking at our own bodies and looking at the bodies of bacteria and so on, we say that, oh, well, we can see that DNA and RNA are about something. Um, and we oftentimes never ask, how did they come yeah, to be about right, something? Right. Um, uh, we just sort of take it for granted that they're, they're carrying information about the organization of the body. But of course, the evolutionary question has to be one about how you transfer from a molecule that's just a molecule to a molecule that can have some relationship to other molecules that's an aboutness relationship. It carries information about them. What I've tried to do is to sort of ask that question in a much simpler sense. And in fact, in part, it was driven by my comparison to genetics to my study in the evolution of language. Hmm. In the evolution of language, one of the things we learned that is that this form of communication that is arbitrary, so to speak, and can carry information about so many different things because it's not tied to its likeness or correlation with stuff, was very late to develop, very late to evolve in the course of evolution, and in fact, in just one species. In many respects, DNA is like that. DNA is displaced from what it refers to. It doesn't, in its structure, have anything to do with the shape of protein molecules or the way that cells interact with their environment and so on. So the question is, how did that come about? Yep. How could it have actually started that way? Probably the most important idea currently about the origins of life is that it begins, they think, in this naked sort of replicator way. By naked replicator, I mean a molecule that can make copies of itself. The problem is lots of molecules can make copies of things. We call them enzymes or catalysts. They can make other molecules. In fact, chemistry is about molecules affecting how other molecules get made. Um, that for me is not enough to tell me how a molecule that gets itself copied like DNA does can be about other kinds of molecules. Um, so I've developed a, another way of thinking about it, which actually says that, in fact, DNA is more a recorder of something that came before. That is, it's a template of something that was originally just dynamical, just a relationship between proteins, for example, um, in mm. a kind of virus-like model. The argument here is that the DNA, because it has a structure that is repeatable but variable. Uh, that is, it can, its pattern can carry information about all kinds of different things that have pattern. The question is, how is it that something dynamical that was actually had a kind of self-preservational dynamics, how could that have been, in a sense, offloaded onto the structure yeah. of a molecule? Right. And so I've developed a sort of three-step argument that begins with what I call an autogenic virus, a, a virus-like structure that's just a sort of ball, a container made of protein-like structures that contains within it proteins that work like catalysts that make other molecules but don't get modified in the process. In that process, you can have catalysts that make other catalysts that can make that first catalyst. You can have what's sometimes called an autocatalytic set a cycle of catalysts making catalysts making catalysts. That in itself is not, doesn't have any purpose. It's just something that happens. But if making a catalyst 
also has a side product that can tend to stick together to form a kind of a shell. It can actually grow to encapsulate all the catalysts that make each other. So then the place where the catalytic activity is most active, shell production will be also most active and will most likely capture those catalysts. As soon as it does, nothing will further happen. The catalyst can't interact with other things in the world. They're trapped in this shell. But if that shell is broken open in an environment where there's other raw materials, the process can start again. And as a result, this structure will repair itself, will close up again. Or if these parts are shredded around into the environment, they will begin this process and you'll see duplicates forming. Mm. This is a process in which just chemically, by virtue of these two self-organizing chemical processes that are now linked to each other, codependent on each other, they now can produce a unit that can reproduce itself and repair itself. But what that means is that if this dynamic, which is there because of the constraints that each of these molecules produce, if by virtue of having a substrate that they can bind to, that keeps them interacting in just the ways that they interact to produce this result, that substrate, that template, can make it more efficient. Mm. But now that template has, in a sense, externalized the constraints of this dynamical process. And the key is that constraints or limitations on interaction. Constraints can be represented in different forms. Just as the same form can be in different materials, the same constraint, a constraint that's dynamical on the chemical process, can be offloaded or externalized onto the constraints of a sequence of the structure of a molecule. Well, that sounds nice. It sounds you know, a bit of a just-so story. It's a completely just-so story. <laughs> uh, but that's good. I mean, that, that gives us a, 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 a target to appreciate or to, uh, to attack, maybe to develop something new. Uh, so it's one thing to say it, but, but another to say, how, how does that happen? You're saying offloaded onto a, a, a DNA sequence uh, that would be great, but how in the world does that happen? There has to be a series of in intermediate steps that I've left out in this story. Um, one is a recognition that many people have had, which is that the molecules that make up DNA and RNA molecules, and these long polymers, the monomers, the subparts, yeah. are also the parts in cells that carry energy from place to place, like ATP, for example, adenosine triphosphate. Um, that's one of the crosslinks, basically, is an adenosine molecule. Um, each of those molecules actually has other roles that it can play in the cell. Mm -hmm. um, the key is that being able to produce molecules that capture energy and fer ferry them from molecule to molecule is actually a useful piece. Yeah, it would be um, So if you had a system that begins as a just simple what I call an autogenic virus, as I just described it, a virus that's not parasitic, but has these very simple structures. Um, if it also generates molecules like ATP that can capture energy in its phosphate bonds and carry it to other molecules, it can actually accentuate the process of catalysis. In fact, that's what actually happens in the cell, that the energy actually helps facilitate better catalysis. Um, but now the problem is, if you're producing a bunch of these molecules, when the system closes up and becomes inert, those molecules that have all this high energy are problematic. One of the ways to keep that free energy from being problematic is to link them up together <laughs> into a sequence. And by linking them up, now the free energy part is trapped. It's no longer exposed, exposed so it no longer can do any damage and ruin the system. Mm. Um, but as soon as the system gets broken open again, um, now this long polymer will begin to fall apart and begin to capture energy again. So an intermediate step is a step in which now you have uh, still an autogenic virus. It's not parasitic again, but now it has this little, you might say, a starter motor in which mm -hmm. it can sort of, you know, I've got a little energy, I can boost the system and speed it up a little bit. That will be an advantage. But now you've got a system that, in its quiescent state, will have produced a, a molecule that was just a sort of a storage for these high energy molecules. <laughs> but now this storage molecule awesome. can actually become a template. 
because it doesn't matter what the order is of, of how these things are stuck together. But now if the order affects the order of interaction of other molecules because they get bound to it in certain order, now the template can determine the order of interaction that other molecules engage in. So I've used this not as a, a clear explanation for everything, because there's many steps that have to be explained, many chemical processes that have to be explained. But it becomes what I would call a proof of principle kind of argument, in which you can say that at least we can now use normal understood chemistry to talk about how a dynamical set of constraints can be offloaded onto a physical constraint that now influences those dynamical constraints. So that it can now be a physical memory that can be passed on, as opposed to just a dynamical system that can be passed on. But now you have something in addition. You also have, since you've got your memory separate, it can also now change in ways that change the physical nature of this structure. So it's not only just a useful thought experiment, but since all the chemistry is known, it's an empirically testable thought experiment. I think that's the important part of this story. What we don't want is just a thought experiment. We want something where we know the chemistry and where we can fiddle with maybe viruses and catalytic processes and reconstruct this kind of process. So it's not just a proof of principle, but it's an empirically testable proof of principle.